Good morning. Again, welcome to Believer's Fellowship. Uh, you'll notice that I'm not here today, uh, but it's a very important event that I'm uh, at today. I'm at my son-in-law, Todd Hamilton, uh, his deacon ordination over at the Met. We're participating in, in his ordination. You know, we're excited about what God's doing in my family's life, and when something like this occurs, I certainly want to be a part of it. But at the same time, I didn't want to lose the, uh, the flow of what we're doing in our teaching on the glorious church. And as we talk about the church and the ministry of the church, and especially today as we talk about the power of the church, I didn't want to just stop and go and stop and go. Uh, a couple of reasons. One, we're doing it in our cell group, in our lift group ministry, so I encourage you to be in the lift group. Uh, quit just kind of sitting on the outside looking in. Get involved and see what God's doing. Especially we talk about the importance of the church. The second reason is, not just because we're doing it in that, but it's difficult to preach somebody else's material, and I didn't want to hand these sermon notes off to somebody and have them try to preach it. Uh, much of this material comes from someone else to start with as we're going through uh, the Glorious Church. The study matches uh, topically the book written by Dr. Tony Evans uh, entitled The Glorious Church. So just to make it easier on everybody, we decided to go ahead and do the videotaping this morning and, and uh, share this message with you today via this type of media. So I hope it's not a distraction for you because we are in the Word of God and the Word of God is always powerful, especially as we talk about the discussion that we're having today in regards to the power of the church, which is the Holy Spirit. So as we get into the message, you know, I'll make the first statement here. It is impossible for the church to be the church that God intended us to be apart from the dynamic ministry of the Holy Spirit. Remember Jesus said just the day before he departed, Apart from me, you can do nothing. So as we look at this study, and we're, we're hopefully getting it into our hearts and minds, that uh, we can't live our life apart from the Lord Jesus and apart from the Holy Spirit. But understand, neither can the church function the way it's supposed to function without the power of the Holy Spirit working in the church and through the church. So I want you to understand today as we look at this study that it's important that uh, we get an understanding, a clarity in our own hearts and minds that we need the Holy Spirit if we're going to be what God's called us to be. So uh, as we look at the Word, as we go through these scriptures today, I pray that you'll get a, we'll get a feel and get an understanding of just how important the ministry of the Holy Spirit is. It's impossible for us to do what God's called us to do apart from the Holy, Holy Spirit. Let's start first of all by talking about the Holy Spirit and how that Jesus Christ promised to the church that he would send the Holy Spirit. I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. If I do not go away, the helper cannot come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. Now, the other verse I read to you about, apart from me you can do nothing, was John 15. This is all part of this discourse that Jesus is giving to his disciples before the crucifixion. He's telling them how, what a priority and how important it is for them to, uh, to understand that he's going to be going, but he's going to send someone else who's going to come, and he's going to empower them, and they will be able to fulfill the ministry and the mission that they have. It's to their advantage. So first of all, we want to talk about the promise of the Holy Spirit. Jesus referred to in verse 13 of that chapter, the Spirit is the Spirit of the truth, and the Spirit of the truth who will guide you into all truth. Now the key to the Spirit's ministry, we've already seen his job in some of our previous messages on the church, the key to his ministry is to guide us, to teach us, to instruct us, but also to guide us into the truth. Now, it's, well, that's pretty much everything we do around here is promoting the truth and teaching the truth and preaching the truth. So it's important that we understand that we have more than just someone who gets up, verbalizes the truth to us, vocalizes the truth to us, but someone who also uh, comes along is the paraclete, the one who comes along is what that word means from the Greek language, and guides us into it, helps us to understand it, and realize what God's word is saying to us. And by, by the way, if we don't receive the spirit of the truth, the word of God literally just lies dormant in us. It, it never really comes to life until the Holy Spirit comes first and foremost and makes us who are dead without Christ alive in Christ, and then plants the truth in our hearts. So understand that without the ministry of the Holy Spirit, number one, we don't have life. But number two, the truth that Jesus has given us to live by, to set us free by, becomes uh, of no real value to us. It just lays dormant there. Now, this is an important promise that Jesus is giving to the disciples. He says, it's to your advantage that I go. Now, why would it be to their advantage? I mean, if you held a business meeting that night in that room where the Lord's Supper is being received, I'm sure that the disciples would have voted, now if Judas is gone, 11 to 0, that, that the Lord Jesus would stay and that he would be there with them. He wouldn't leave. But remember what we said last week and the week before about the ministry of Jesus. It, even though he's sovereign Lord, it is still limited because of his human body. 
He's limited to time and to space. He's not going to be more than one place at one time, any more than you and I can be at one place, more than one place at one time. So it's to their advantage that the Holy Spirit comes because the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, that's that omnipresence of Holy God is manifest the Spirit of God, and it's the Spirit of God that is at all places, at all times, whenever the need is, and whatever is going on in our lives. So it is to our advantage that the Holy Spirit comes and fulfills the promise that Jesus said. So the Spirit of truth, He's the promised Spirit of power as well. In fact, Jesus indicated there's really no power that's equal to the Holy Spirit. Acts 1.8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria, even to the remotest part of the earth. So not only is it our advantage the Holy Spirit's come, He's also our power source. We can't do what God has called us to do as Christian and uniquely, especially as the church, to do what God's called us to do be impossible without the working and the empowering of the Holy Spirit. Now think about what this promise means. Remember, the apostles had spent more than three years of listening to Jesus and learning from Jesus and watching him perform his miracles, uh, getting the instruction, hearing the truth. There was no uh, lack in understanding at this point after three years of giving instruction. But what was lacking really was going to be the power of God to carry out that instruction for them to fulfill the ministry and the mission that the Lord had for them. He was just their Bible teacher in present flesh, but now the Holy Spirit would come and he would bring power to them. And when did that happen? Well, Jesus told them, you know, you're going to receive power in Acts chapter 1. He told them to go up to Jerusalem and wait. It happened in chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues of, as of fire, dis distributing themselves, uh, and they rested on each one of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. Here's the day of Pentecost. They're all together in one place, and here's the promise being fulfilled of the Holy Spirit coming. Now, the Holy Spirit comes at this point, and the church is born, basically. Everybody who trusts in Christ this day now receives this, the indwelling promise of the Holy Spirit who comes to work in them, live in them, guide them, and to bring them the power that they would need to have to fulfill the ministry that God had for them. The Holy Spirit was working now in the church like at no other time in history. Uh, well, there is no church before history, by the way, at this point. But now the church is born, the Holy Spirit comes, and He empowers the church. What we need today, more than anything else, more than conferences, more than seminars, more than more deeper instruction on issues of the day, what we, we need more than anything else is the filling of the Holy Spirit and the empowering of the Holy Spirit in the church. We don't need more programs. We don't need more institutions. We need God to fill His people. There's no substitute for the power of the Holy Spirit working in my life and working in your life. We can get information, and I am by no means downgrading seminars and conferences and information and all those things, but what we desperately need is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. What believers fellowship needs desperately in our walking lives is to constantly, continually be experiencing the life of the Holy Spirit in our church. I really believe what we do because we don't have the Spirit's filling in many cases is we begin to institute more programs and, and, and more projects and hopes to have something happen. I really believe, folks, when the Holy Spirit is empowering the church the way it is supposed to be empowering the church, we'll probably have less programs. We do lots of things in the church toward discipling and making disciples, but sometimes when we miss the work of the Holy Spirit, we begin to institute programs to do certain things. I mean, let me take for an example. It's one thing to have an evangelism training program to disciple people and how to win souls. At that point, those people should be empowered in their life, surrender their hearts to the Holy Spirit, be, empowering, be empowered by the Holy Spirit, and go out and win souls. But that doesn't happen. And so often we put a program into place which just goes about, well, we're going to do this to win souls. But if we were filled with the Holy Spirit, we'd have plenty of souls being saved without the program. And that's the objective we miss so often. We try to, we try to put something in place and we miss what the, the, the Lord wants to do and, and what God desires to do. Uh, we need Bible teaching. We need instruction. We need training. We need discipleship. But, you know, the teaching is really just a prelude as we receive the teaching. 
It's just a prelude to what God wants to do in our lives. We should all be filled with the Holy Spirit. And as we're really being filled with the Holy Spirit, we're experiencing the power of the Holy Spirit, and we experience the supernatural grace of God on our life. And as we do that, and as we go out, and we're being what God's called us to be, I believe we'll probably have less programs than what we had before in our life. So the greatest thing that can be said about any church, ultimately, is that its people are filled with the, with the Holy Spirit, and they're doing the work of God as the Holy Spirit's working through their lives. So the Spirit is, is promised to come. Then the Spirit is also active in the church. We know uh, since the day of Pentecost, when, when that happened, uh, that the church is the people of God has, has been indwelt and been energized by the Holy Spirit. That's where our source of strength is. That's where our source of power is. It, not always seen by people yielding to the Holy Spirit, but that's still where the activity of the work of God comes in as we yield our lives and our ministry to the Holy Spirit. What I want to look at just in this part of the message are, are some distinctives. Uh, we talked about distinctives of the church last week, but I want to talk about the Spirit's distinct ministries and just a couple of things that He has to and through the church, and then we'll talk about the Spirit's empowering. But to look at the, these distinctives, first of all, understand that the Spirit, of the, the Holy Spirit, of God indwells each and every believer. Are you a Christian? Is Jesus in your life? Then you have the Holy Spirit. There is no saved member of the church of Jesus who does not have the Holy Spirit living inside him or her. If you're a Christian, you are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. If you're not a believer, guess what? You're not indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Jesus said of the Spirit's coming that he will be in you. Remember, this is back to this discourse of Scripture right before Christ is leaving, John 14 and 15 and 16, wrapping up everything for his disciples, but he's trying to tell them this comfort is coming. He's going to empower you, and he is not going to be just beside you, near you, around you. He will be in you. In fact, the Holy Spirit baptizes, we've seen this in past studies, every believer into the body of Christ at the moment of their salvation. Here's what happens when you get saved. And we, we do the external picture of it by, uh, by taking people, and we have the baptistry, and we, we put them in the baptistry, and we baptize them in water. And they go into the water, and they come out of the water. That is a, a picture of what literally happens to you in the spiritual sense when you give your life to Jesus Christ. You are placed in the body of Christ. I mean, the Spirit comes, and He baptizes you into the glorious church. Every believer is a part of the body of Christ, and you're placed inside that body. That happens to every Christian. Nobody, nobody is saved without being baptized by means and the operation of the Holy Spirit into the, into the body of Christ. Now, I know there's a lot of uh, discussion on that, and there's a lot of uh, dialogue that goes on about the baptism and what that means, but in reality, every child of God is born into the body of Christ. They're baptized in the body of Christ, so the Holy Spirit baptizes every believer at the moment of their salvation. Now, you can look in 1 Corinthians 12, and you'll see that at the moment. Paul writes to the church in Corinth. He writes to the church in Rome. Romans. Read Romans chapter 8, around verse 9, where he's talking about, hey, you need to understand if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit, he's none of his. In other words, Paul's saying, if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you're not a Christian. You don't belong in the body. You're not a part of Christ. So rejoice in this fact that if you are saved, you have the Holy Spirit. He's in you. You've been placed in the body, and now Christ lives in you by means and by the operation of the Holy Spirit. If you don't have him, he said in Romans 8 and 9, you're not him. Now, I just lost my microphone, so give me a second. One moment, and pull it back out. The Spirit not only is the one who comes and saves us, and he's active in our life, he indwells us, but the Spirit is also our teacher. In fact, one of the Holy Spirit's most crucial and yet often overlooked and undervalued ministries in the church is the fact that he is a divine teacher. It's one thing for me or some other uh, lift group leader or, or Wednesday night service, one of our pastors, our youth pastors and uh, women's Bible studies. All these people, yes, are teaching us, but ultimately we need and must rely upon the Holy Spirit to teach us. Back to John 14. The Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. You say, well, what's the difference when somebody teaches me versus the Holy Spirit teaching me? I think the big difference gets into the fact that one is transformation. That would be the Holy Spirit that takes the truth that we've heard. The other is just information. Remember that Jesus is in the upper room prior to the crucifixion, 
and he's talking about the future ministry of the Holy Spirit, he said, he will teach you. A little later, he mentions it in John 16 again, and he says, when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. If you want to know the Word of God and all its power and all that it means for your life, then you're going to have to subject yourself to the Holy Spirit's instruction and the Holy Spirit's leadership. Because the Christian life is more than just following uh, some kind of manual. And I, I remember not too long ago, my son-in-law uh, asked, called me up and said, I, I, I purchased this playground uh, uh, for my daughter. You've seen the swings and the slides and all the little, little playhouse and stuff. He says, uh, got it on sale, but I need some help putting it together. I said, no problem, I'll bring some tools and we'll put it together. Well, when I get there, uh, there's two different sets of instructions. I get, you know, uh, for, for the, for one's the right set and one's the wrong set, so we have to go through a long time to figure out which set is set. But then we begin to follow the instructions. Now, uh, I, my mama told me a long time ago, you can do anything in the world if you just learn how to read. So we read the instructions. I know something all of us don't always do. But with this particular project, I wasn't about to embrace it without reading all the instructions. So we looked through everything, sorted out all the materials, and sure enough, I thought, perhaps an hour to put this together. We spent five or six hours putting this little playground equipment together. We finally got it all put together and all finished and pat ourselves on the back because we had followed the manual. I feel too often in the Christian life, that's kind of the way we look at the Word of God. as some kind of rule, as some kind of law, as some kind of manual. And that if we follow the manual properly and we do what we're supposed to do, then we'll get all the pieces together and, and then it's good and, you know, but... Please understand, the Christian life is not an assembly manual and following a manual. In fact, the Scripture says, Paul wrote the church in 2 Corinthians 3, he said, the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. We need the instruction. We need the information. We need to get those principles down from the Word of God. But you can actually go to church, learn biblical principles, get the teaching, study the Word for yourself, and it still not be of any effect in your life unless you're allowing the Holy Spirit to come and apply those principles and teach you those principles. That's why as a, as a pastor and a teacher, it's, it's easy to get stuck in a, in a mode where you're just getting the lesson down for everybody else. I, I need to learn the material. I've got to get the information. I want to get this down so that, you know, that, that everyone is, is going to understand the instruction and, and get it in their mind. And all too often, it's just a matter of information, scriptural knowledge, without really allowing the Holy Spirit to come in and make that a part of your own heart and your own life. So it's important when you study the Word of God, give the Holy Spirit the room to come in and give the application to your heart. But not only the application, the Holy Spirit gives you the empowerment as He teaches you. He also gives you the grace, the strength, the wisdom you need to follow through with the instruction. So it's not just about learning some scripture or learning some information and truth, and we must learn truth, but knowledge for his own sake is never the goal. And scripture says knowledge puffs up. We're supposed to be transformed by the truth, and it always, it always brings life and it always brings grace. If what you have is arrogance because you have information, then you haven't allowed the Holy Spirit to teach you the scriptures. You haven't allowed, you know, life to come. In fact, that's what Jesus rebuked the Pharisees about in John 5 when he says, you know, you search the Scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, but they speak of me. In other words, they were getting all this information down, and they were going through all these principles, but they weren't allowing the Holy Spirit to give them real life from it. That's why when Jesus gets on the scene, whom the Scriptures were prophesying about and teaching about, they had no idea that he was there. They had no idea who he was. And they missed it completely. And it was only bondage because information, is, is, it, it cannot stop there. It has to move forward to transformed lives. So it's the Spirit of God that, that really teaches us, brings life, brings light, brings humility, brings grace. But also it's this Holy Spirit that will equip us for ministry. There's one more activity in the Holy Spirit related to the church. That, and we need to point this out uh, before we turn to the Holy Spirit filling our lives. And that's the fact that it is the Holy Spirit that will equip us. We've talked a lot about in recent days about being involved in the church, finding your place of ministry, finding out what your spiritual gifts are and doing those things. But ultimately, it's not a pastor and it's not a deacon, an elder, someone who's going to point those things out. The Holy Spirit has done a work in your life already. The Holy Spirit is the source of spiritual gifts that make it possible for any of us as the church to execute the ministry of the church. God has gifted you, all right? But he didn't just give you a gift and you kind of operate. 
He empowers you. He not only equips you, he strengthens you. He gives you what you need in regard to that. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 12, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. There's only one Holy Spirit, multiple gifts. If you go to our 301 class, and Brother Strickland teaches and preaches, you'll learn a lot about spiritual gifts. Hopefully you've been there. And you've discovered or making discovery about what your particular bent, your particular spiritual gift might be. Well, the Holy Spirit gave that to you. It's not your personality. It's not a talent. It's a supernatural gift of God. He's equipped you that. The Bible says to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. In other words, if you read 1 Corinthians 12, God gifts you, but He doesn't just gift you for you. He gifts you for the body of Christ so you can find your place to serve God and to be used by God. Verse 11, that passage, but one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually just as He wills. In other words, not only does the Holy Spirit give the gift, He selects the gifts. I've been in places of ministry and preached in churches where certain people in the church felt like it was their responsibility to give a gift. No one can give you a gift. Only the Holy Spirit gives the gifts. No one can transfer you a gift. Only the Holy Spirit gives you the gifts. But you need to realize He's given you a gift. If you're saved, you have a gift. But you, you don't have the gift of sitting. You don't have the gift of watching. You don't have the gift of previewing or the gift of critiquing. You have a gift of the Holy Spirit that God has given you to enable you to work in the body of Christ. So there, there's place for discussion a lot more on gifts later on. But understand it's the Holy Spirit who gives these gifts, not individuals, not a committee. And He's given, to you, given, given you a gift for a reason. You need to fulfill find out and fulfill that particular reason. But also we see that not only has the Holy Spirit equipped the church, the Holy Spirit, He fills the church. The Bible says, do not get drunk with wine. All right, that's pretty good that we can stop right there and preach a sermon. Why? That's dissipation. But be filled with the Holy Spirit. God has called every child of God to be filled with the Holy Spirit and to walk in the Holy Spirit and to live their life according to the Holy Spirit's direction, according to the Holy Spirit's enabling, according to the Holy Spirit's power. Don't be drunk with wine. That's dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. In fact, that is a command from the Lord. That's not a suggestion. It's a flat-out commandment, uh, and it's a, a commandment that requires, obviously, the Holy Spirit, but it's, it's a plural commandment. God tells believers fellowship. God tells every church for us to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's what we seek with every service. That's what we seek in every meeting, whether it's a small group meeting, a, a Bible. We want God's presence to fill the place, to energize the place, and to instruct us. We don't want to come and go through ritual. It's not our desire to just kind of walk through routine services, sing a certain amount of songs, sit down, listen to a sermon, and then go home with unchanged lives. It's God's desire to come into our services, even like this service today, and fill this place and fill our hearts with His presence so that we, we walk out of here empowered, enabled, individually, but also corporately to work out the will of God for our life. So that the Holy Spirit is command. It's a command for every Christian, but it's also a command for every church. Now, let me say this. As I said earlier, I made the point. Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. And it's important we understand that. Praise the Lord, though. We are not without Him. We have Him. Let's talk about the necessity of the Spirit filling our lives. Obviously, He said, without me, you, cannot do no you can do nothing. So therefore, we need Him if we are going to do anything. If this is true, if we must have the Holy Spirit's filling in, in us, uh, we need to ask the simple question, are we being filled by the Holy Spirit? Are we allowing the Holy Spirit to work in our hearts? Are we allowing the Holy Spirit to energize our life and to fill our lives so that when people look at our lives, there's really not a natural explanation for our lives? That they see us living a life that's different, acting different, speaking different, dealing with problems on a different level, uh, dealing with issues in our life in a different manner. And I really believe the reason most people are not living that supernatural life, that kind of life, there's, there's no natural explanation, it simply gets down to this, we're not being filled with the Holy Spirit. So that what comes out of our mouth, what goes into our hearts, what we live out, act out, move, move, move by, is not God's direction. It's not God's Holy Spirit. It's not God's Word. It's just out of the flesh. Why is that happening? It's because we're not allowing the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts and in our lives. You know, th there's some great Bible teaching that goes on here. There's some great Bible programs that take place here, and we thank God for that. But unless the Holy Spirit is filling our hearts and filling 
not only the people on the platform doing ministry, but filling the people within the chairs and in the pews to do ministry, then what are we accomplishing? We're not accomplishing anything. And we need to ask that question about our own life. What am I accomplishing in my spiritual life? What is God doing in my heart and life? And if He's not doing anything, why is it not happening? Well, let me simply say, if we believe the Bible, then it's not happening because God is not filling us, the Holy Spirit is not filling us on a daily basis. We need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You say, Brother Joe, you know, I thought you said earlier that I was, I was baptized in the body of Christ by the Holy Spirit and that the Holy Spirit lives in me. In fact, John 3 says, God gives the Holy Spirit without measure. If I am dwelt by the Holy Spirit, if He's living in me, and I am His child, and I have God in this, this vessel, it's the temple of God, then why am I not experiencing the power of the God who lives in me? Well, that's why the Bible says it's important, number one, that we are saved so that we can be indwelt by the Holy Spirit. But now it tells us that we must also, and we are commanded, by the way, we are to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So the, the Spirit's filling is different than the Spirit's indwelling. Uh, if you're a child of God, you are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. But the issue is, now that I am indwelt by the Holy Spirit, am I being filled with the Holy Spirit? Now, the word filled means to, to come under the control. If you look at Ephesians, again, 5, he says, don't get drunk with wine. That's a good analogy. He says, that's a waste of time. It's a waste of your life. It's, it's useless. You know, he says, but you be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's a good analogy because it uses different words from drunk and being filled, but the idea is the same. If you take the wine, the alcohol, the liquor, the drugs, whatever it might be, the first thing that it does, it affects your thinking and your behavior. So what happens is you submit yourself to alcohol, then you undergo a transformation. Anybody who's ever been drunk knows this. Anybody who's ever seen anybody that's been drunk knows this. You, you do things you wouldn't normally do. You say things you wouldn't normally say. You act in ways that you wouldn't normally act. I mean, you may be timid and shy. You get a few drinks on somebody. All of a sudden, they're bold, or at least they think they're bold. They're usually obnoxious and not bold, but in their mind, it's boldness. They think they can do things that, that they really can't do. They, they get in their cars. They, they, they've had some drinks, and they get in their cars. They think they can drive. Instead, they get in an accident or they kill somebody. They can't drive. If you get drunk, you can't do the things that your mind is telling you you can do, all right? It's just not going to happen. But it's a good analogy in regard to the Holy Spirit, but kind of in reverse in a lot of ways. When you submit yourself to alcohol, it's affecting the way you think, the way you act, and the way you feel about things. When you submit your life to the Holy Spirit's filling, it literally means to His control in your life, you begin to act differently. You begin to think differently. The difference is now that you really do have boldness. Right now, it, it being filled with the Spirit, you have the ability to live the life that God's called you to live. You have the power to love. You have the power to forgive. You have the power to serve Christ. You have what you need, but you have to not only have it in indwelling, you also have to be filled with the Spirit. And by the way, we are never commanded to be indwelt by the Spirit, but we are commanded to be filled with the Spirit. And so the issue now becomes not only am I indwelt, but the issue becomes now am I, am I filled with the Holy Spirit? It's kind of like the, the analogy of an engine, you know, and a car. A car without an engine is not going anywhere. Well, the, to the engine to the car is like the Holy Spirit to the church. The, the church needs the engine. It's like the engine to my life. He, I, I have him in my life. But that engine to run has to, has to have filling. All right, we, we go to the station and we, we put gas in the car and it fills the, the, the tank up so that the engine has, can fire properly now and go. But the same way, we, we need to submit to that filling and that filling is the Holy Spirit. But it's not filling like to fill up and overflow in that regard. It really has to do with the context and the concept, back to like the alcohol, of who's going to control your thinking, what's going to control your life. Who's going to control your heart and your, and your mind? So that brings us to not only the, the necessity of being filled, but the renewal of the Spirit's filling. I mean, you kind of carry out the step of, the, of leaving the gas station, you know, and filling up your car. As soon as you leave the gas station, what begins to happen? What begins to happen is that you start uh, using the gas. The needle starts going down. I mean, you just spend a lot of money, you just fill it up. It doesn't last long, especially in Houston. We drive a long ways, and... You, long commutes, and we, we use a lot of gas. It's the same thing in our spiritual life. As soon as we 
come to the Lord every morning. We submit to His filling in our life, and throughout the day we're yielding to His control, but that's only good for today. The idea of being filled with the Spirit in Ephesians, when it talks about being filled with the Spirit, is a verb which literally means to keep on being filled, to continually be yielding your life to the Holy Spirit. It's, it's not really some mysterious spiritual process. We are literally filled by the Holy Spirit as we consciously yield to Him and turn over every area of our lives to His control. So that means that today I get up and I say, Lord, I'm yielding my life to You. And I'm consciously setting my heart, my mind, my affections on You. Today, You're in charge of my life. And then as I go throughout the day, I'm yielding my heart, my life, my mind, my actions, my reactions, first and foremost, to the Holy Spirit. And the beautiful thing about this, not only does He guide me into the truth, you know, He teaches me and enables me, but He, he empowers me to, to do what He's, what he's instructed me to do. We, we have what we need to, to be what God's called us to be. That's why we call it being filled with the Spirit on a daily basis. It's not, so it's not this idea, well, I just do this once and, and then I'm, I'm done with it. Uh, um, it's, it's a continual walk and flow in our life. I believe it's the same thing when we come to church. I, I believe that when we come and we gather in, in the, as the church of God and the people of God and we gather together to uh, sing songs of worship and pray together and hear the Word together, I believe that's a time of God's grace and filling. If we're yielding. Too many people come to church with, a, with, with an entertainment mindset. Let the professionals on the stage do it. They come to church with, a, with, a, with the idea of I'm going to watch, I'll be in church, and I kind of get that off my checklist for the week. But we all walk into the house of God with a focused heart, a focused mind that sets ourselves before the Lord and says, Today I want to hear from you, God. Today I'm going to worship with the people of God. Today I'm going to sing with the people of God. Today I'm going to offer thanksgiving with the people of God. We're going to be the, 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 the worshiping, moving, living church of God that you've called us to be. And we're yielding our hearts and our lives to the Holy Spirit so that you can make that happen to us today. Guard yourself because it's easy to fall into rut and routine instead of really surrendering our heart to the Holy Spirit. And as we come like this and we gather like this, it's, it's like there's fresh wind. You come to church with that attitude, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. It is, it's like fresh wind and, and, and fresh fire. fire. David, the psalmist, said, Lord, anoint me with fresh oil. I believe that's what church is supposed to be like. There's a spiritual dynamic of corporate worship that, that should bring that to our hearts and life. But that's also in our daily life. We're, we wake up with that same focus and intent about our life that today belongs to the Lord. And you really don't have to wonder what, what the Holy Spirit's filling is like because the Bible tells us again in 518, don't get drunk with wine. And, that tells, and then tells us, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Instead of that, this is what you're supposed to do and this is how you're supposed to be. Again, we call it being under the influence of alcohol. When it possesses your thinking, your processes, and dictates your responses, then you lose control. When you're filled with the Holy Spirit, basically, you're coming under His influence. You're allowing Him to fill your heart and mind. You're coming under His control. But if we're not doing that, guess what? Then, then our behavior's not changed. When you drink, your behavior's changed. When you're filled with the Holy Spirit, your behavior's changed in a way that glorifies God. Why do we lose our temper? Why do, we get, why, why do we yell and shout at people? Why do we get all bent out of shape in traffic? Because we're not being filled with the Holy Spirit. Why do we act in certain ways? Why, why do we say things with a wicked and evil tongue? And when we know we should have said something different, because we didn't allow the Holy Spirit to fill us. Why are so many churches powerless in what they're doing today? Uh, constantly in conflict, constantly in disunity, because they're not allowing the Holy Spirit to fill the church. Why are so many homes in, in such disunion? Many times, it gets down to that. We're just not allowing the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts, to fill our homes, to fill our life. What I'm saying is that we'll never get victory in any area of our life unless we are yielding to the Holy Spirit's power in our life and He has firm control. Jesus is being set aside as Lord in my life on a daily basis. So the question gets down is to who or what is filling you? If you're going to be filled with the Holy Spirit, you can't also be full of yourself because the Holy Spirit isn't going to take second place to our ego. In other words, I can't start my day off with my agenda. I have to find out today what is the Lord's agenda. Am I going to live for me? Am I going to live for Christ? And I believe that if you would start your day like that, if I start my day like that, if the church's ambition is that, 
Today is the Lord's day. This is the day the Lord has made. Today I'll rejoice and be glad. That's what that passage is all about, is the saying that my life is going to be motivated now, led by, directed by the Holy Spirit. It's the same mindset that we talk about walking in the light, to see us in the light. Why? So we can have fellowship together, because that's what it all boils down to. It's not about assembling the playground properly, following the instruction manual. It's about the fellowship of the Holy Spirit in our life. He's there to equip us. He's there to be active in our life. He's there to enable our life. He is there to fill our life. What are we talking about? What are we focused on? What motivates us each day? Well, it ought to be the power of the Holy Spirit. He doesn't want to minister in little bits and pieces in our life. It should be a flow. Jesus talked about a, a, a river of life that would flow from your innermost being. That's the Holy Spirit. So it shouldn't come in spurts in little places, but there should be a continual, living, flowing stream of God's activity in the heart and life. You say, Brother Joe, that's, that's exactly what I want. I really want to live that kind of life. How do I experience the filling in my life? Well, let's go back to Ephesians 5. After saying, don't be drunk, but be filled, he says, he tells us how. Speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father, and be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. And we don't have the time today to break that thing down by verse by verse, but I'd hope that maybe in your cell groups and in your lift group studies that you might look at that a little bit closer because what he's saying here, and let me, let me just kind of summarize this verse, and, uh, it, it's an act and an attitude of worship more than anything else. It's, it means today my attitude is going to be that of worship towards God. My heart is going to be set on worship towards God. I mean, if we really want to be a spirit-filled church, then we have to be a church that understands the context of worship. Worship in our life, worship in our walk, worship in our, in, 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 in our home. I mean, if a church wants to be a spirit-filled church, then it's going to be a church that learns how to worship and to relate to God, according to that passage, to each other as well, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns. If we're going to be a family that wants to be a spirit-filled family, then we have to be a worshiping family. If your family doesn't worship, if you can't gather together around the table and pray together and even sing songs and memorize scripture together, uh, focusing on verses together, then you're going to miss the, the filling of the Holy Spirit in your home. If you as an individual want to be spirit-filled, as an individual believer, then you must know what worship means. And you're going to have to discover how to worship. I really think that that is lost in the church today. We're too content, as I said earlier, to let the professionals do it. When in reality... We ought to be joining in worship when we wake up in the morning. When we drive to work. When we're at work, you're at school, no matter what you're experiencing, you ought to be an attitude of worship, thanksgiving, you know, with an attitude of humility that is also a part of that whole thing. But worship, if you go back to Ephesians 5.18, it says about speaking to yourselves and to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And, and first of all, it says speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And then he says, then make melody in your hearts to the Lord as well. So there's a relationship that I have with each of you, we have with one another, with, as believers in Christ, we have to learn how to relate to one another. And we also realize that this worship is, is correlated to other people in my life, my wife, my children, my church, the family of God. So this, this worship involves a relationship both with God and with other believers. That's why, listen carefully, that your local church is such a vital part of your spiritual walk in life. That's why it is so hard for you to experience the daily feeling of the Holy Spirit in your life if you're not worshiping with other believers. There needs to be participation in the body of Christ. The Bible makes it clear that that's important in our life. So find your place in the body of Christ. But all these things that are mentioned in 518, giving thanks, psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing, deferring to one another, loving one another, they are all critical in your life and in your walk if you're going to worship God. As you worship Guess what's happening? You're yielding control to the Holy Spirit. I think what needs to happen is we get back to the place where Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. And get back to the place in our hearts where we're willing to say, and listen carefully, we're willing to say, Lord Jesus, today, I am desperate for you. I cannot do anything without you, Jesus. And if you don't fill me, I don't have any hope for real living today. If you don't take charge of my life, my life is useless. Come back to the place of recognition, of pure humility. As James said, humble yourselves before God. Draw near to God, and He will draw near to you. Say to the Lord today, I need to be filled with your Spirit. Start Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, every day of the week. 
every week of the month, every month of the year of giving every moment as you can possibly can to the leadership, to the headship, to the filling of the Holy Spirit. First of all, you must be saved. Second of all, you must be filled. Third of all, you must worship God. That's corporately. You need to be in a body of Christ. The church is God's mystery, hidden from the ages, but it's for you. But you also need to be a part of the fellowship, an active part of serving Christ in your life. And then yield to Christ and see what he does in your life and see, see and experience the truth of God's word. Your life will be changed in a real place, in a real way, in a definite way. Let God do something in your life. I want to pray for you. Maybe you need to pray right now with your heads bowed as we go to the Lord. Maybe you just need to cry out to the Lord and say that same prayer, Lord, I'm desperate. I need you today. Help me to realize that. Help me to understand that. In the midst of my situation, I need you to be God. Lord, I pray today as we hear this message, it goes beyond instruction, information, and knowledge to genuine transformation. Touch our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.